Next session for Echo Voices will be Lynn Graphica. They're going to come and talk about AAC training and products. Miss Sarah Schneider will be joining us. But today in Echo Voices, we have Dr. Ray Height. Right? Did I say that correctly? Absolutely. Well done. Excellent. Okay. And he's going to be talking about low and mid tech AAC for our inclusive classrooms. Ray, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you. Excellent. And as soon as you're done sharing, I will share my screen. There you go. Awesome. Let me just hit the right button here. And make sure a couple of things here. Make sure we've got our subtitles on and we are going to get going, by golly. All right. Good morning, everyone. It is so great to see everybody here today. We are going to be on an adventure for the next little bit of time. I did have to promise that I would keep this in good time parameters. Any of you who've heard me speak before know that I'll be done by Friday. So it's not a big deal. Get ready. Here we go. Ask those questions as we move along. So as we're going into our classrooms, especially our inclusive classrooms, we want to get a sense of how we can take that mid and low tech AAC and make it something that's as transparent as possible. What do we mean by that? Well, I'd like to start by, and some of you have heard me say this before, by getting a sense uh, of your understanding of what is assistive technology. Now, as a former administrator, you also know that I call on people randomly. So um, Kelly, since you're out there, would you mind answering the question, what is assistive technology to you? I think that it's hard for me not to quote it from the definition. So <laughs> it's it's tools and services um, to provide functionality within, you know, everyday situations, living, school, wherever you may be. Absolutely phenomenal. I knew I could count on you for the uh, formal definition. So A++ to you. Here's what we want to consider. Think about those words as they just went in. And I'm going to tell you something along the way. Some of you are using the exact same type of assistive technology by that very definition that I'm using right now. You just can't tell because I've got my contacts in today and you're wearing your glasses. By that very definition that we just heard from Kelly, glasses and contact lenses are assistive technology. Trust me, you don't want me driving without my glasses or contact lenses. People on the sidewalks are wary of that, but that's something that we need to understand. It's not an us and them type of technology. It's an us technology. And that's why creating this transparency and using some of these tools from the very time a student enters school allows a differentiated approach and a different view. And we'll continue to talk about that as we go through. So as we are looking at some of the various types of products that are out there. We're going to start with AAC, and we're going to look at it in three categories. We're going to look at carry-alongs. We're going to look at single-message communicators. And then we're going to look at multi-message that are more desk, table, or other types of devices that aren't normally carried along. Why are we breaking it down this way? Because all three of those categories can be used in so many wonderful and different ways. So the first thing we're going to look at are carry-alongs. What do I mean by a carry-along? Well, guess what? They have handles. They are in a backpack. They are something that you can grab with a shoulder strap and move along with you. We know how to use these when we're working with our individuals. However, how do we use these in that inclusive classroom so you, you don't have just one student who stands out? Let's talk about that for a second. So not that I have props along here, 
like a quick talker or a go talk or and i've got everything else don't worry when we get to those slides you'll see them but let me give you an example i'm just going to hold the quick talker here because i like the fact that the handle's on its side again all of these devices that i'm talking about today are good devices are rock solid they just have other things we can be doing most people will use this as a communication board that's absolutely phenomenal when was the last time you used it for a pre-k or a kindergarten class or a first grade class along with good night moon or some other book and put the pages and the words from the pages in your voice or someone else's voice on each of the buttons. Now, guess what this is? This is a read-along companion. And it allows a student, as they're learning to process and understand the very basics of reading, to quote-unquote read to themselves. Why is that important? Because then this becomes a tool that you can be in multiple places at one time. Students can be checking this out of the library along with that book and having that reading going on. But then this is not obtrusive when another individual has to use it for communication. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's great, but what about older students? The most unique use of this I have ever seen actually was at a high school in the Plains States where a chemistry teacher decided, having worked with some of these in past with some students, got one that was sitting on a shelf. And no assistive technology should ever sit on a shelf. But got one of these, and guess what he put on there? He put all of the elements with how they were pronounced, you saw the picture of the element in there. And then, uh, I'm not a chemistry guy, something about covalent bonds or numbers. I have no idea, but some chemical type of stuff. But what a great way for his students, neurotypical or neurodiverse, to have kind of a study companion that they could pull out and utilize. All from a mid-tech AAC device. But again, that's what's making these things transparent. As we start to look at each of the groups, and again, I'm going to qualify this. In my mind, there are a limited number of groups that make quality AAC on the mid-tech and the low-tech side of things. Please be wary, because in this day and age, you can run down to the dollar store and get a, a button that you can record and everything is honky-dory. But again, in, in my neck of the woods, the dollar stores are now a dollar and a quarter. So amazing how that happens. But here's the problem with those. They're made of a plastic that does not necessarily take people banging on it. They're made with electronics on the inside where that voice sounds like it came out of some 1960s reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. And I know for a few of you, you're going to need to go and Google what a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder is. But for those of us uh, of a different generation, you know, it's good to see you on here with us. So as we look, I know you're going to have Joni from Attainment speak in the future. I love Go Talks, go, gold standard and have been around forever, there is accessibility to their products again. So as she comes in, she'll get more in depth with you. So I don't want to repeat things that you'll hear later on. So I'm gonna to move to the next group that again, I have the utmost confidence in and that's AbleNet. So they've got the quick talkers, a couple of differences between these two. I'm gonna flip back and forth screens just so that you know. Obviously the color is one difference. The second thing is where the handle is. And that's going to be important for our individuals. It's going to be important for any of us using this with a student. Why? Because I love the fact that, again, it's easy to grab a go talk, carry it along with them. However, when you go to use it, you've got to kind of hold it like this, or you've got to stand in front of them and hold it. 
if you're working with an individual where they're going to be using this, sometimes a side handle is just different. It's not a better or worse thing. It's just a different alternative. So that's why you want to think through. Don't think that if you've got one or the other, they're not good. They're both highly quality devices. So in all of these, what you want to recognize is that there's going to be five levels. So when you've got five levels of recording, and again, whether you're using a GoTalk or a Quick Talker, it's going to be the bottom rows of buttons. And that's what allows you to have the messages. We know that. We utilize it again. But for our younger kids, what about putting core words? What about breaking them down to not just the core words, but maybe a different sheet has action words, the verbs. Another one has certain nouns that you're covering. What about things like that as you're going in? Again, what you're doing then is you're introducing an AAC device into an early classroom, allowing multi-purpose usage. These should never be sitting anywhere on the side. So you do have multiple recording levels. For both the GoTalk and the Quick Talker, the three buttons at the top are always going to be consistent. And forgive me for preaching to the choir for some of you, but it's important to know that those should be those buttons that allow all students, not just specific ones, but all students to communicate important things. You know, I need help. I need to go to the bathroom for some of our young kids. Things like that. And why I say it that way is because what happens is this. You will see your neurotypical individuals, your students, that when they want to go to the bathroom, will pick this up and press the button because it's fun. Guess what that means for our individuals that need to use this? All of their peers are saying, this is a cool device. And that's what we want to get in our minds. That's how we make things transparent. We bring them in and we have them working. So again, stories, words. If you want to take it to a chemistry class, please go ahead, but make sure you talk to someone who understands chemistry before doing things like that. Other things that I've seen utilized with this, math equations. You know, think about, again, for those of us of a different generation, learning times tables. That was always so much fun. But now imagine this. You're putting on different levels, one times one, one times two, one times three as your graphic. But the word that comes out of this is the answer. What are we doing at that point in time? We're keying visual and auditory feedback. And if they're holding the device, we're adding in that depth of kinesthetic input as well. So again, turn something like that into a device that can be used all over. Some of you may be familiar with the Prox Talker, you know, Glenn Dobbs and the story of his son, Logan, and how he put this together. Absolutely phenomenal device. It's wonderful. You use RFID tags that are not going to interfere with any medical equipment, pacemakers, or anything else. It can be carried around just like a backpack. And what I love about this is the fact that, so you see some of the tags, you see the device, you can quickly and easily grab the tags, that kinesthetic response, put them on. So I'm gonna put this on here. I like mushroom and ham pizza. So you heard, I have a picture of a pizza and someone saying, I like mushroom and ham pizza. What is also great about these is that you can change things on the fly. Why is that important? Because now you can, again, play games within a classroom where you're identifying things on those RFID tags. But now you're having all students give verbal feedback into the tags. And along with that, you can have tags utilizing other languages. So think about that, that again, we take something like a prox talker, but we bring it into a language classroom and we start working with students, maybe who are learning another language, 
maybe some of our ELL students as they go back and forth. And so these are things that we can be, again, incorporating in. I will give one caveat. Although this is a great mid-tech type of device, it's also of it's anything we're going to talk about, the, the most expensive thing that is on there. And you're talking probably about $3,000 for a full set for something like this, whereas some of your other devices, you're talking a couple hundred dollars. So you've got to be thinking through what is going to bring you the best approach to the students in a most cost effective way as well. So those are some things to consider, but I do love the Prox Talker for its flexibility in that way and its durability. It also is something that's inconspicuous. I'm gonna pause for just one second before I move into single message. Anything about the carry-alongs that you have question-wise for me? Okay, not an issue. Uh, there is a final exam at the end of this, so I hope all of you are studying and taking good notes. Oh, goody. <laughs> <laughs> as we look at some of the single message communicators, and I threw in here sequencers as well, we want to talk about some of the ones that really stand out the most. And why? Because again, there's so much we should be doing with these devices that we don't. Again, for those of you who have heard me speak before, one of the favorite things that I have to talk about, and of course the battery just fell out of the back, so hang on one second here, is my Big Mac. And single message communicator, absolutely great. But this is not a Big Mac to me. This is my. You are awesome. My you are awesome button. Why do I use it that way? Well, the first group that I usually bring this to is when I speak to school nurses. The second group is administrators. Why? I bring this in and say, you should have one of these in your office and mount it by the door. Remember, on the back of these, there's actually places where you could just put some simple hooks up and this can be mounted. But now imagine the power of a student being able to walk into an office, press a button and hear, you are awesome. Imagine it's that school nurse's office, a person that should be equated with health unfortunately, is normally equated with you being sick. Or when I was principal at the high school level, it meant the place you went to go to try and, and get out of a test, which my nurse Marge was phenomenal. She'd send them right back to class. But going in and pressing that button, the school nurse hears 100 times during the day, you are awesome. That's probably a lot better than getting a call from an administrator like myself. But here's what we're actually doing in that case. We're giving that feedback to an individual. That might be the only compliment they hear all day. What we're also doing, though, and just as importantly, is we are desensitizing our neurotypical individuals to the use of an AAC and switch-like device. Because now... It's something that, hey, I've seen it in the nurse's office. How come that, that person gets to use it? I, I, I like using it. And that's what we want. We want that student that has to use a communicator like that to feel good because they're doing something their peers, their neurotypical peers actually want to do. And then guess what happens at that point? It's no longer assistive technology. It's just cool tech. And that's what we want to keep in mind as we go in. You also want to consider, you know, uh, the Big Mac, the Big Talk is enabling devices uh, product that goes along with this. So when I talk to any group about mid-tech and low-tech AAC, the, the companies I always refer back to, the manufacturers, are going to be attainment, are going to be AbleNet, are going to be enabling devices and are going to be is going to be adaptivation. Those are the groups that get it. Those are the groups that make adjustments 
based on the feedback they get from the schools. A lot of other groups just throw things together and you've just got to be cautious with that. So the Big Mac and the Big Talk are very similar. What I like about the Big Talk is that Enabling has really done a nice job changing the angle of it as well. Ever since COVID, when they began creating their products, they went to a 3D print model, which actually has made those devices a little bit cleaner. And I've noticed they, aside from looking better, actually operate a little bit better too. So that's their version of a Big Mac. A sequencer, which you see down at the bottom, an adaptivation product, actually allows you to put in multiple messages and have them come up at different times in a different order. And it allows for some feedback that a student may not get. Well, how do we use that? And many of you use it and use it very well. Well, how do we use it for the neurotypical individuals? Well, how about putting something like that on a teacher's desk? In having some of the messages that come out be things like one problem less for homework tonight. Two, uh, two minutes of standing up and walking around in the classroom. Different positive activities that can be there that a student can come up and basically operate this in a randomized fashion. Now, guess what? It's become transparent because it's something that allows us to get different information as we're going in. It's something that allows us to actually operate in a way that we've taken assistive technology but incorporated it into our day-to-day -day as we go through things. Down at the bottom, some of you are familiar with put them arounds. You know, a, a great device, uh, again, enabling put this together, that can be mounted on walls. Why would we want something mounted on a wall? It's probably one of the most important things you can do in any classroom, and here's why. Whether you're using a put them around or something we'll be talking about in just a moment, a talking brick, when you put devices like this around a classroom, they can be giving directions. You know, you might put one of these, you know, probably more so a talking brick above the homework for the night. And that way you have homework that's written on a, a dry erase board or on an interactive whiteboard. And you have a talking brick next to it that allows you to put your voice on it, giving the auditory feedback about what that homework is. You might have a put them around by the doors you're walking in. And if you're going to do it and really create the idea of transparency and accessibility, you simply put a Braille strip on it, a Braille label, and have something as simple as introducing them to the classroom. Hello, this is Ms. Ms. Smith's fifth grade science classroom. So that when they press the button, they hear, they get the auditory feedback, but they also feel the Braille. Why is that important? That's important because they need to get used to the fact that some things will be in Braille. It was interesting. And many of you know this, the reason for this already. But in the early days of ATMs, if you drove up to one or you walked up to one, you would have Braille right on the keypads. Now we've got touchscreens. You've got to use it in a different way. You usually have the auditory feature that you can pick up. But the question that people asked was, why was there Braille on the keypads at a drive through ATM? Because, again, the common folk outside of our community didn't understand. They're like, listen, if the person can't see, why would you have Braille there? Just make normal keys. What they didn't understand was, at some points in time, that one way needed to be a different way. You had someone that had visual impairments that wanted to go to a bank machine after hours. Whoever was driving them would turn the car around and drive up next to the window 
kind of opposite the way you'd normally go. But guess what it allowed them to do? It allowed them to access the ATM because the Braille was right there on the keys. So what's important is for us to understand that people that encounter Braille sometimes just don't understand. And it's okay, but let's start working with our kids at a very young age so that Braille also becomes something they're just used to. You know, and think about it. Those of us who work with, you know, middle school or high school kids along the way, the middle school kids would be going, yeah, yeah it's for the kids that can't see. But the beauty is if we can change that where now it's, what are those bumps? That's eh, Braille. It helps Timmy. Well, guess what? Now it's a different association. And that's what we want to get to. So I love put them around. You know, they're really for a nice message coming in, an introduction coming in, introduction to the principal's office. You know, welcome to, you know, Dr. Hype's office. Please have a seat. You know, a lot of my kids wished that was what they were hearing, but that's beside the point. But those are the types of things that, again, what we're doing is we're, we're changing the dynamic. What about those AAC devices with multiple selections? Well, a couple of different types out there. You already saw, saw me introduce the idea of the talking brick. Talking bricks come in a three-pack. That's why I've got this in multiple selections. They actually can be fitted together. There's little slides that you can connect them and put a sequence of messages. You could put a sequence of answers where a student has to listen, remember, and then associate an answer. Or again, my favorite usage is to put them throughout a classroom. This is great for simple instructions. What about if you're doing group work? You're doing different locations of things. Have one of these by each location where it describes what they're supposed to be doing. Why is that important? Well, that allows a teacher to be in four places, wherever they're standing, in these three places at the exact same time. Guess what's going to happen? Because we've seen this. This is not just something that, that we make up. We've seen this. When access to a device like this is out there, everybody wants to use it. And so now what's going to happen is you've got kids fighting over who presses the buttons for the instructions. That's okay. That's what we want. We want that excitement generated because that's felt physically throughout a classroom. So again, instructions, guides. I've seen a school that has put these in a hallway. This is a unique use. What they did was they threw a little Velcro on the back, but they created a sensory filled hallway and had set different ones of these at different locations. One of them was simply they pressed the button and said, stand still and breathe deep for 10 seconds. Wow. What a great, what a great way to have. Of course, immediately my mind went back to my high school hallways where it's like, you don't have 10 seconds to stand still. Somebody's coming your way. But if you're creating that idea, maybe even within a classroom, you can have things like that as a reminder to our kids. Other devices with multiple selections. You know, what you're seeing there on the screen is an iTalk 4. There's different different styles of iTalks and, and different devices. Uh, again, this is just uh, AbleNets. You've got some from enabling too. But what's great about devices like this, again, in the context of creating that inclusivity, is now put this at group stations where you have different answers that are put forth. So it's not always communication. However, you can also use communication, too, in this way. And I thought this was one of the most brilliant things I had ever seen. A, an elementary school had these, had a couple of them in different classrooms, and one classroom had three of them and had it at different tables. And once every day, they would have an activity that was a no-talk activity. 
isn't that every parent's dream, though, to have no talk activities, by golly? Unfortunately, at this day and age, some of them call that the iPad and whatever games they're playing at that point in time. But the no talk activities actually required all students to use these as the feedback tool they were given out. What it began to do was have students process in different ways. Why? Because not only were you thinking about the answer, you weren't able just to blurt it out. So for some of our students that talk before they think, it was a little bit difficult. It caused them a little bit of disconnect early on. But because of that cognitive dissonance that was happening, they started to learn how to think first, then press the right button. Ray, it looks like we have a question. Yeah, of course. You have your hand raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Um, hi, sorry. I just, I love the idea of um, the instructions in the area and hanging. I think that is brilliant. I love it. I'm just thinking from a teacher's point of view, even though I'm an SLP, um, that how do we protect these from getting like ripped off and you know, the walls or especially the talking bricks, since they are kind of not as damage proof. Is there, do you have some tips around how, yeah, how to keep them on the walls where they belong? So a couple of things. Um, number one, try not to put them on pla uh, plasterboard walls, you know, where again, a kid can just rip and if they rip it off, they're going to rip off paint. They're going to rip, you know, uh, some of the board off as well. When what that kind of points us to then would be metal things, uh, would be some of our wood based things. And of course, those of us who still operate in cinder block walls. But here's what I suggest then make sure you check with maintenance. And with that, as long as maintenance says it's okay. Go down, go down to a Lowe's, a Home Depot, whatever home stores by you and get the heavy duty Velcro. Because then what happens is this. Number one, they can't just knock it off the wall. That heavy duty stuff is not like, again, what you get at the $1.25 store. It's going to hold it in place. The second thing is when you put the Velcro strips up, put them in areas such that you physically could move them around. And I'm going to stay and really focus on these just for a moment, because you're absolutely right. These are the most delicate of all of them to be operating with. So the reason that I would say put a number of, you know, the one side of the Velcro on the wall, you're able to move these around. So what you're doing is you're also creating an inconsistency they're not always going to be up there in the same place. So that child's not going to be able to walk up there and know today it's right there. I'm going to walk up. I'm going to knock it down or I'm angry. I'm going to go hit it and I'm going to do whatever. The third thing, and this is probably the most important thing, is these have to be introduced at a young age. Here's why. Think about those devices that the kids take the best care of. If you ever saw a child in this, this go, and I say child, but I'm talking middle school kids, you know, by the time they get to high school, they've got it figured out to a degree, but definitely our middle school cherubs. Um, if a kid brought in a DS or brought in um, any other type of gaming device, they had been trained since they were kids to be careful. What did they hear from, you know, their, their parents or guardians? Don't break that. You won't get a new one. Okay, they've never heard that about these. So it has to be something going on. Yes, you can press that. Yes, you can work with it. But you've got to be careful because this is a device. You might be having fun and always present it that way. You might be having fun with it. But if it's broken, we all lose it. And I hate to say create peer pressure, but create peer pressure. Because then that floats through. The other thing about putting this, something like this, more so on a cinder block wall, 
because we're going to have kids that escalate. We're going to have kids that get angry and want to rip something down because they don't like the direction that's coming from it. But if it's on a cinder block wall and they smack at it, it's almost like putting your hand into a flame. You're also going to get another type of feedback sensory wise that's not pleasant. And so we're training behaviors. Now, are any of these 100% child proof? No. Our kids can break anything. I heard a teacher tell me the story one time of how uh, she, and this was a couple of years back at Closing the Gap, she was in a classroom and had a child that got so mad they bit into and cracked an iPad. I'm going, oh my gosh, that's. That's like the little girl on, uh, uh, I forget what the movie was, you know, um, uh, Lemony Snickets, I think. It's, you know, that had strong teeth. It's like, okay, well, there you have it. That's not an iPad being thrown against the wall. So our kids can't break things, but it becomes a behavior that's trained with it and just a little bit of precaution going in. The last thing I want to say to that, you had an interesting comment. I'm not a teacher. I'm just an SLP. You are a teacher. You are so important in what we're doing because of the therapy. All of our classroom personnel make a difference in our kids' lives. So don't ever let me hear you say that again. You're getting the straight finger now. When I was an administrator, people knew. Straight finger advice, crooked finger, not good. You got called into my office and sat across the desk, not at the round table. So, so remember that you are essential to what we're doing. Did that address your question? Awesome. Yes, thank you so much. Great ideas. Great. Appreciate it. Oh, not a problem. Um, the last thing I want to point out, some of you are familiar with this, some of you are not. It's a little bit bigger. And this is the activity board from Praetorian. What's neat about the Praetorian activity board is it can be used in a group setting. It does have multiple selections. It's also got some pre-programmed sounds based on where you're at. So, for example, with early learners, you've got sounds like animal sounds. You've got simple number sounds. You've got indoor sounds versus outdoor sounds. So you've got some things that are programmed in. So automatically... It can be introduced as a game device. You know, hey, what sound does the cow make? And they've got to remember where the cow's moo is. It's like the old speak and say, you know, it's spin it around. The cow says moo. Those are the types of things that, again, can be introduced. And then as you begin to carry this along, you can introduce the idea of these being multiple selections as you move on. So... Again, just some ideas as we're going out, trying to give you a sense of how some of these can be used. So before we move into switches, any other questions that I can address on that? Because switches are going to be important because for some of our kids, AAC also needs to be addressed through the use of a switch. And don't worry. For those of you who are concerned, I do have my time timer, so I know how much time we have left, by golly. I have a quick question. Yeah, I don't know if you'll, sorry. We have a, I, I'm an AAC specialist for the district. I inherited a, some of the equipment here. We have a bunch of the um, really small personal like ID, you know, just one message that clips mm -hmm. on and then yeah. the ones that are a square that opens up. If you at some point could talk about ideas of how to use, wh what those could be used for, uh, you know, just that would be awesome. Because we so have. Let, let me go ahead and, and get to that right away, because I think that's absolutely brilliant. Again, you're going to find single message communicators, some of the small things and some of the things that have just been, you know, put out to pasture um, it, over the course of time. If they're still working, the first thing that I would suggest, and again, you don't have to do this, but my suggestion is get them in the hands, first of all, of the teachers. Why? Because it can become for them, and we do have to train the teachers a little bit with this. Um, the, 
I, I should say the gen ed teachers as they're getting some of these too, but train them to have some type of positive affirmation that comes out and have it sitting right at their desk. Because a lot of times think about the whole idea of going to the teacher's desk. That can be intimidating and it shouldn't always be intimidating. There's points in time where those little cherubs need to be intimidated, but you know, for a holistic standpoint, something positive that can be said, something that might pin on oftentimes would go hand in hand with your role or other therapists or an administrator walking up and down. I had an SLP who used to do this. She had, she went uh, to, again, one of the home stores, you know, a Lowe's, a Home Depot, and bought a tool belt that had a, a drill holster in it. And what she put in it was a Big Mac. And it was very simple. She would walk up and down the hallways. And what the kids learned real quick was you couldn't address her directly. You had to press the button. She would, if you came up to her, she would pull this out and they'd press the button and it would say to them, good morning. How are you? How can I help? And what was great was the kids would then come back and just say, hey, I just want to say hi. I want to do this. But guess what she was doing? She was training them all that it's okay. It doesn't matter who you are, press the button. And what a great way to use something like that. But again, once we get that school staff, including the administration, to be using things like this, it's no longer that assistive technology that they use. It's the glasses and contacts assistive technology. So that would be my first suggestion right off the bat. Put it in the hands of the teachers, the therapists, and get them to do something positive with it so that, again, it's it's out there and it's part of the environment as a whole. Good? Awesome. All right. Uh, let me check real quick. Chandra, we're dealing with about 10 minutes, right? Um, we end at 9.15. Oh, perfect. So oh some time for Q&A, but I think that you've kind of built that in, and I think we're good. Awesome. So I'm going to put up here on my time timer. I've just adjusted it right now. And I am going to talk about that on the sensory side, too, real quick. But I've adjusted it, so we'll be done by Thursday, no problem. So when we're taking a look at the whole idea of switches, the idea of switches, especially when it comes to AAC, has always been access. But what you want to understand, too, is that we can begin to include switches, again, into our classrooms for engagement and fun. And so what we're trying to do is, you know, as I put down there, think giant-sized cause and effect. Think answer buttons. Think something that all of our kids can interact with. Because then what we begin to do is we begin to pull back on the on the mythos of what's a switch. You know, it's absolutely amazing sometimes when you hear people from the outside going, well, why are they using that? Isn't that cheating? Why can't they just use? And the irony is they, they might be using a mouse with their computer. Guess what a, a left click is it's basically the same thing as a switch you know and, and, and that's not always understood because we don't translate it that way for people you know and so that's what we want to start doing how do we put these things into a way that all of our kids start using them and then they just become more accepted you know i keep talking about kids and behavior, and forgive me for going down this path, but I, I really want to make sure that that we get this, that behaviors can be trained. When um, my son was in elementary and then high school, he went to school with this beautiful young woman um, who was given 72 hours to live after she was born. Well, as I just mentioned to you, uh, she lived a little bit long. As a matter of fact, I just commented on one of her Twitter feeds last night or X or whatever they call it these days. 
She was born, though, just as a torso with one limb and a digit, a single digit coming out of that limb. Smart as a whip. And if you ever doubted her, she'd let you know she was smart as a whip. But one of the things that she used to do and they used to let her do to move around was not always be in a wheelchair. Sometimes they'd let her go on top of a modified skateboard they had for her. And she would use her limb to move up and down just in short areas. What was amazing was the entourage that she'd have with her. She had people carrying her books. She'd have people doing things. I happened to be in the school one day talking to the principal. We were talking about uh, accessibility and some other things. And suddenly this little boy comes up and pushes the principal out of the way. He goes, hey, what are you doing? He goes, so-and-so's coming. What did the principal do? It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. The principal takes a step back and goes, oh, next time just say, hey, so-and-so's coming and I'll step out of the way. He didn't yell at the kid. He acknowledged what the child was doing clearing the path that's the kind of behavior we want to train we want our neurotypical individuals to look at our neurodiverse individuals as their classmates as somebody they can hang out with and all of us have those stories it's the outside world that sometimes doesn't get it so ray so, yeah it, it looks like we have um we have a question in the chat from Chelsea. Chelsea, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I'm in a really noisy place, but I'll try. Um, so trying to balance having buttons and like things in a static spot, like thinking of like motor pattern and like students with cognitive deficits versus like making it more dynamic to use it for like in a gen ed setting so mm -hmm. just talking about that balance oh what a great question thank you chelsea i appreciate that so when we're talking about the whole idea of the the static versus the dynamic it really is going to be contextualized in that particular case because what we're doing when we begin to create that dynamic usage of them so again, let's let's go back to the idea we were talking about just a little bit ago, where it was, okay, let's put the you know, talking bricks up on a Velcro wall, but or on a uh, cinder block wall on Velcro, but being able to move them around. That's dynamic. We're getting everybody involved. We're going in. But then we know that we've got certain planning, motor planning that we've got to do. We've got certain ideas we're trying to teach where it has to be static. What you want to have, and it doesn't necessarily, it, it can't always be in every gen ed classroom. But what you can have is a set station. So you walk into history class and you know that you're going to have, and again, I'm just going to use these because they're easy. These three together in early elementary history and it's going to be a, a pattern of responses coming in. That's consistent, that student is aware of it. What that classroom should have in at least one, if not two spots, are other single message communicators. And those could be your dynamic ones. Because what we want to do, and again, this is why your question was, was you know, I, I love working with this group. You guys are so brilliant. You want to create a scenario where the static and the dynamic live together. Because then that makes it okay that you've got these three talking bricks put together here at the station every single day. And it becomes a respect factor, again, with the child that might need to use it the most. You know, th that the peers of that student as long as you guide it along the way, the peers of that student are going to protect that spot, which is absolutely beautiful. And even those individuals that may not be a close friend of that, they'll at least respect that. You know, here's, here's an interesting thing. When we, we talk about this whole idea of the dynamics between the two, 
it's how we are creating the environment and the messaging that we're giving, granting accessibility. Having that static spot that needs to be consistent with one person, as long as it's balanced, and again, it doesn't need to be three or six or whatever around the classroom, as long as it's balanced with one or two other things that others can access, in the minds of the kids, it's okay. When we have that imbalance, when we have a room that only has the static, well, everybody wants to be there. Well, and, and that might not be appropriate for all of them. And so that's what we're trying to do in that case. You want to create that balance. And again, it's a training of the teachers in an inclusive setting. You know, change the message each day. Do something that is going to stand out for the kids. And make it positive. And I keep saying make it positive because I saw a classroom where it, uh, it, this was at, at the secondary level where a teacher was a wee bit smarmy and didn't like the fact that his principal had told him to use, use at least some single message communicators. So his was sit down and shut up. Not real great, and he wasn't real thrilled when the principal had a discussion with him either. But when we train and we say, no, this is this is empowering the students, and what it's doing is it's creating an environment that supports what you're doing in the classroom, that's when they tend to get it. And not all teachers are like that. That's the rare few that are out there. Chelsea, did that kind of give you some ideas about how you want to approach that I know I she's got that. To... Yeah, she's got a lot going on in that yeah. background there. Awesome. Um, awesome. Good. Thank you, Chelsea. All right. Um, so let's let's go ahead. Let's talk a little bit about some of the idea of switches and different switches you can get to. For so many people, when you talk the idea of a switch, they're going to think solely jelly bean. Press down. You got clicking sound. Everything is good. Not all of our kids can access it. Plus, the other thing is you can also have some of those students who are going to perseverate on that clicking sound. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that we are able to introduce other types of switches. There, you know, the question I will always start with whenever I'm asked to support a school, whether it be with an individual student or even switch purchases, they'll say, well, what kind of switches should we get, you know? And then they'll ask the question, what's the best type of switch? And it's a very simple answer. The best type of switch is the one that works. And so that's what we want to be thinking about. What are those kids? What are their abilities? What's their strength? And so that's why when we start with this, consider some of the proximity switches that are out there. Many of you are familiar with the candy corn. So let me turn my candy corn on here just so that you're aware to AbleNet has, is putting an end of life on small candy corn. So in the future, the large candy corn is the only one that you'll be able to get. Um, and, and that's coming up. They've already announced it. So if there's any little candy corns out there, they will not be around much longer. But the large candy corns are great because literally, and I'm going to do this so you can see, as long as you're within a quarter inch, you're activating. You you may be hearing the little noise. I've got the sound turned on so that the, you can have that auditory access along. Why is that important? It's important because sometimes you've got a student that may not be able to lift their hand, but they can slide over and activate something on a, on a desk, on a table. Why is it important for some of our other kids? Because it's fun. Because they don't have to touch. In what they do... And from an OT standpoint, it's great sometimes because they'll play games with the neurotypical individuals where they'll say, okay, I want to see you not touch the switch. It's like the old game in the back of the car when you got your two kids there, not touching, not touching, same thing. How close can you get without setting it off? It's a game. And for those students that need this as access, it's a great way to have it. You wouldn't necessarily use this if you've got kids that are going to continually pound down on it. But again, for activities where maybe you've even got it along a wall so that somebody can 
come up and access it that way? How would you use it with just some of your standard students, your neurotypical students as you're going in there? Well, what if you had your switch going into a light or a toy? And so they'd come up and they'd interact and that light would go on or that noise would come out, that toy would activate. Again, it's a way of introducing switches and the need for them in a differentiated way. But what we're also doing is saying a switch isn't just a button that you press down. The other one, and I really love this one, and I know that you're able to borrow this out there. This is the honeybee. If you haven't seen the honeybee yet, this is fast becoming one of my favorite switches. And the reason why is it's both proximity and touch all in one. And the way it works is that you actually have little arrows that allow you to go all the way up to six centimeters above to the touch feature. And when it's touch, you actually have to press the little square. Now, immediately, some of you look at this and are like, oh my gosh, my kids will be playing with the buttons. That's why the case, this is ad adaptivation, and Jonathan's amazing when he designs this stuff. The case, when I turn it around, you set it up, and then the kids only see this. And it's great because you can either have it set for, again, that proximity or that direct touch, and now they're able to guide. You have, <clears throat> excuse me, this set in a classroom, again, to activate a light. You know, and why do I say light? Because sometimes you might have groups of students working together. Well, if you've got a few of these lying around, use that as the way they activate a light to answer a question instead of raising their hands. Oh, their light came on first. And that's a great aspect for things. And if you're doing something like that and you've got students that you're trying to make sure they interact, <clears throat> you can kind of set it so that all the neurotypical students have to touch, whereas you've got it set at maybe three or six centimeters and all those neurodiverse students need to do is come across and break the plane, giving them that sense that, yes, things can be as fair and accessible as possible. So the honeybee, another great switch to, to be considering as you use that too. And then the final thing up there is the movement sensor switch. This has always been one of my favorite switches. What you see there, it's not a joystick. It's actually flex tube with fiber optics on the inside. It's designed, it's, it's an enabling devices product, and it's designed with the same type of fiber optics that if you walk into any Halloween store in this day and age and you walk by something and you trigger, you know, Frankenstein, you know, dancing or whatever, it's the same type of technology, except you're not going to trigger Frankenstein every time you go by. You're going to trigger whatever it's hooked up to. But what I tell people sometimes is if you've got one lying around and you have a student that doesn't need it, use it, especially at this time of the year, because you can other things up to it. And you've got your own built-in Halloween decorations and, again, are desensitizing your all your individuals to the use of a device like this. I will use this a lot when I've got students that are in a wheelchair and maybe have very limited head movement and can't use a full head array. But if you angle it the right way and change the sensitivity, even just a subtle movement can activate something. I will also use it when you've got students that maybe have their hands on a tray or a table and can only flutter a finger. Absolutely phenomenal for activating it that way. But when we're training, our neurotypical students to use it, have fun. Create it so that it's only a set way. You don't have to show them the box. You just have that coming out. You have the tube coming out saying, this is how you activate. So again, just some thoughts as you're thinking through this. Other types of wired switches. And I want to make sure you're aware of these going in because not all of our kids, again, will be using a jelly bean. I love jelly beans. I think they're great. I think they're inexpensive. <clears throat> I think that, again, the only issue with the jelly bean and other switches like it uh, is that if you hit too hard, you can break it. But that's why the, the buttons at the top there, you see the black, blue, and red ones. Those are Pico buttons if you're not familiar with them. Pico buttons were designed by a gentleman uh, over Sweden or Denmark. He designed it for his niece who actually had a jelly bean and kept knocking it off her wheelchair. And she'd try and help by trying to pick it up and would normally run over jelly bean after jelly bean. 
These are designed with steel reinforcements along the side. And the ones I'm showing there have what looks like a water drop. They're water resistant. So if you've got that child that that's drooling, that's okay. Don't move the switch away thinking that they're going to do things. Let them still use it. Why these are good, again, in that alternative setting where you're turning on a light or you're having an answer button is it's not going to matter if you've got that, that middle school kid that doesn't know his own strength and he bangs on it. It's going to hurt his hand before he hurts that. I have literally stood on these and then cleaned them off and then had somebody use that afterwards just to demonstrate. The other thing you want to be aware of, these are fun and unobtrusive sometimes. These are pal pads and they come in different sizes. Here's how I introduce these with neurotypical individuals though. Again, as you're doing activities, you start young with this. Why? Because aside from tapping on it to activate, you can also swipe to activate. And so for our pre-K and our first grade kids, if we've got this hooked up to, again, a game, a toy, you can begin practicing swiping. And in this day and age, that's a life skill, you know, with any touch screen that they've got. And so what we're doing is we're teaching a life skill to every single person but still saying, yeah, okay, it's just technology. And what's great is too, and I'm not going to do it here because I know I'd close down everything and probably disconnect myself, but think about your mouse pads. It's the exact same type of movement, except you're not necessarily moving the mouse, you're just clicking. And so it's teaching so many different skills as we come in. But again, by introducing this young, it's not something that, looks unusual later on then you've got some other types of switches out there like finger switches and and other types of switches that your students might work with if you've got them sitting on a shelf somewhere for a finger switch i will always say give it to a teacher give it to a teacher when they're doing a powerpoint why because if they've got that finger switch hooked up and they click guess what they're doing they're moving their screens around and what's happening in that case is the kids are going, that's pretty cool. And so later on, when they see that individual that needs to use the finger switch, they're going, oh, I've seen that before. You know, Ms. So-and-so had it in, in her math class, and it was so cool. She used to do PowerPoints with it. That's what we want. That's what we want. Right. Yeah. I, have a, I wanted to make a comment, Claire, uh, mm -hmm. a couple minutes ago, uh, said that she had a student um, who they programmed the message for each day. It took care of the student's behavior, and he was motivated for that privilege. And so I like that. And I'm thinking about, um, you know, building communication and building OGCOM or whatever we want to call it, a classroom technology, if you're using it, building that into routines is also important. And so, you know, giving kids a role in the routine helps to have a, a, something that's part of that, but also helps to say, okay, on this day, the student who has their own device is now going to be the vocabulary reminder. And so that's the role that's part of our group. So whenever we say this word, that person now is the vocabulary reminder or the one who says, reads the weather. Uh, but just looking at what are the routines and giving someone a role, first of all, empowers them, uh, but also gives lots of opportunities to put these kind of um, things in place. Uh, we know the student who requires a, a, a OGCOM is going to have their own device, but it just really gives an opportunity for everybody to be part of it in a standard routine. So thanks for that suggestion, Claire. Everybody likes to have a role and to feel... Uh, successful whenever they are able to do it. Claire, that was awesome. Thank you. You know, and thank you for introducing that to Deb. Um, this is why we need discussions like this, because we've got the ideas that are out there. We've got the examples, and this is why it's so critical. I do want to be cognizant of our time, which is running very low here. Yes, a couple of things couple real quick minutes. there. Yeah. <laughs> couple of things there are Bluetooth devices out there that can be used in a multitude of ways. But here's what I wanted to make sure that we really got to some of the, the absolute low tech. When we're dealing with low tech, I, I've got to share a story. 
you know, about alphabet pebbles. I love these alphabet pebbles. They're a great way, again, <clears throat> we look at them, we say, oh, wonderful, they're manipulatives. We're able, our kids can put words together, our kids can do things, but it's the thinking outside of the box. Had a teacher, shared with me a story. He had a, a young man who was both physically and verbally uh, ataxic, and it was very difficult for him to communicate, very difficult for him to move, yet was a very intelligent young man. So one day what this teacher decided to do, got a bunch of sets of these and came up with a game. As the students walked into the classroom, handed each student three or four of the pebbles. And this is uh, exactly how he described it to me. I'm not going to use real names or anything, but he said, all right, all of you got three or four pebbles. We're going to do an activity today. I'm going to have, a, I've got a stopwatch here. I'm going to time you. You're going to put those pebbles together to come up with actually a phrase that many of you might know that's going to lead into our next unit. Uh, we need somebody to be in charge today. Uh, Tommy, you're going to be in charge. Uh, Tommy was the young man. And Tommy got really wide-eyed and nervous because he was never called on to lead anything. But the teacher knew he was very intelligent. So what ended up happening was this. The teacher said, okay, so remember, we're trying to put together a, a, a phrase, a couple of sentences that are going to, that are familiar, but I'm going to time you. Ready, Tommy, go. He said, Tommy at first stood up and started doing this. And the teacher got nervous. Well, the teacher got nervous. The kids understood. They all came to the front of the class with their stones. And Tommy started pointing at people, started putting some things together. And then the teacher said the most amazing thing happened. His eyes lit up and he started pointing at words. Or when he could say a word, he'd say a word and put them in different places. Less than seven minutes and 30 seconds later, Tommy had directed his class to put all of these together to form the first three lines for the preamble for the Constitution of the United States. Less than seven minutes and 30 seconds. At which point in time, the class went back. The teacher said, great job. You guys were awesome. Little girl in the back raised her hand. She said, I know why you made us do that. And the teacher's like, Doc, I had no idea what was going on here. He goes, but I got nervous. And I go, well, tell me what was going on. She, she said she folded her arms and said, you made it like we were the first Continental Congress and had to come in with just a little bit of information and figure out things. And you put Tommy in charge because, sorry, I get broken up at this. Everybody knows he's the smartest. Tommy didn't know. Tommy sat up. Teacher said, I don't lie to my students, but I looked at her and said, well, you got me on that. But that's the power. Oh, let me tell you what class it was, too. These little alphabet pebbles. 12th grade advanced placement United States government. And that teacher still does a different, <laughs> uses different phrases, but still uses the pebbles today. And the kids love it. That's amazing. Love it. So that's what we want to think about. You are, I am going to send a, a copy of this via PDF. And at the very end, because I know that <laughs> I heard my little buzzer going off. Uh, <laughs> you've got my contact information. I am here to assist you however I can. Please feel free to reach out. Email is the best. Uh, I do a lot of traveling, but I get back to everybody within 24 hours. I may not have the direct answer to the question you have. You know, I do know that the cheetah is the world's fastest land mammal and speeds of excess of 70 miles an hour, but that's probably not your question. But I do have a network and we'll find whatever support we can give you for that.